Welcome to CMES Conversations, a series of interviews with leading scholars and thinkers hosted by the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver. Today, Associate Director Danny Postel interviews Marcin Milani, the Executive Director of Strategic and Diplomatic Studies and Professor of Politics at the University of South Florida. Marcin Milani is the author of The Making of Iran's Islamic Revolution, From Monarchy to Islamic Republic, and is currently writing a book about Iranian foreign policy. He has recently published a series of articles in the Washington Quarterly and Foreign Affairs mapping Iran's role in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, the Iranian-Saudi rivalry, and the prospects for detente between the U.S. and Iran in the context of the ISIS crisis. Thank you for joining us on this episode of CMES Conversations. So first and foremost, Professor Milani, thank you so much for being here at our Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver. It's an honor and a privilege to have you here. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I look forward to our conversation today. Likewise. And um, your lecture this afternoon at the University of Denver um, is not at all ambitious. It's just a very small set of questions that you're dealing with. The ISIS crisis, Iran's policy toward Iraq and Syria, and the Iranian-Saudi rivalry, plus, of course, a whole discussion about what the United States should do about all of the above. So it's great that you've picked such a small topic for your lecture this afternoon. But I say this in jest, but quite seriously, um, all of these issues are interconnected. And if we could just take one piece of them. Here's my question for you, Professor Milani. What does the rise of ISIS and the U.S. response, the world's response to ISIS, mean for U.S.-Iran relations, now especially in the aftermath of the Republican midterm election victory uh, just a week ago? There's a lot of talk of, on the one hand, ISIS has brought the U.S. and Iran together, Mm -hmm. and you've written an entire article on that topic for foreign affairs. On the other hand, The Republican victory um, has seen some statements from people like John McCain, other members of the Republican Party, neoconservative pundits, saying, attacking President Obama for his letter to the Supreme Leader, Khamenei, about ISIS. So it seems that this could go in a couple of different directions. What's your take on what the ISIS crisis means for U.S.-Iran relations today? As you know, uh, ISIS, uh, the Islamic State for uh, Iraq and Lebanon and and Syria, evolved from uh, uh, an organization called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. In around 2004, after the American invasion of Iraq, Al-Zarqawi, a Jordanian-born jihadist, created an organization. And then two years later, that organization, under his leadership, pledged allegiance to bin Laden, and they became known as the Al-Qaeda in Iraq. In 2006, after al-Zarqawi had started a sectarian war against the Shiites inside Iraq, the American Special Operation Forces killed al-Zarqawi, and then after that, uh, al-Baghdadi, the current leader of uh, ISIS, took over, and then they split from Al-Qaeda uh, and established, created this new organization called ISIS. They were sort of kicked out of Al-Qaeda, weren't they? Yes, they were kicked out because uh, Al-Qaeda considered them to be too radical. That's an extraordinary notion. That is a single greatest achievement for <laughs> that organization, to be kicked out uh, because they were too, too extreme radical. That's right. for Al-Qaeda. So when, um, uh, a few months ago, Uh, ISIS was able to uh, control Iraq's third largest city, Mosul. Then ISIS suddenly became uh, the buzzword in Washington and among the pundits in Washington. Um, They easily were able to defeat uh, the Iraqi army in certain parts of Iraq. The army and sort now, of melted away. Melted away. And now they are in control of a significant portion of Iraq. Uh, 
and Syria. Roughly the size of Great Britain. Roughly the size of Great Britain with a population of somewhere between 8 to 10 million people. Now, this is something Al-Qaeda was never able to do, to, to lay claim to such uh, a swath of territory. Absolutely right. Not only they control a large swath of territory, they also have been able to sell oil and finance their uh, operations. And they also have been getting considerable financial support from some private uh, individuals in some of the Persian Gulf countries such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar and others. Some of the countries that are formally part of the coalition against ISIS. That is correct, and we'll get to that later on. But when ISIS was able to undermine the Iraqi army, the Islamic Republic of Iran was one of the first countries to recognize the danger that ISIS had posed. In fact, the Iranian government had been warning the Americans and the Europeans about the danger of uh, ISIS and uh, other uh, jihadi organizations in Syria. But unfortunately, those warnings were ignored. I think they were ignored for a simple fact that a lot of people thought that if ISIS and al-Nusra and other jihadi organizations are undermining Assad, then it's okay to ignore them. But to be fair, the United States did declare al-Nusra a terrorist organization. Yes, they did but they could have done much more to stop uh, their spread, uh, much more to stop their expansion. But unfortunately, they did not. And I think not only the U.S. didn't do it, but much more importantly, none of the so-called allies of this coalition against ISIS uh, had any uh, desire to stop the expansion, because at that time, their expansion, because at that time, the thinking was that if we can undermine Assad, in Syria, if we can remove Assad from power, that means Iran is going to lose its most important ally, and then Iran won't be able to use Damascus as a conduit to transfer arms and money to Iran's most important strategic asset in the world, Lebanese Hezbollah. And that is why they ignored it. But Tehran, going back to ISIS in Iraq, Tehran did not, uh, did not look at ISIS as just a mere threat. They looked at it as a very profound national security threat. And therefore, Iran was one of the first countries to provide logistical and military support to the Kurds, first country to do that. And they also began to provide advisors to the Iraqi government and they, uh, that Iranian-backed militias became involved in defeating ISIS. Shia militias. Shia militias. Now, going back to the fundamental issue you raised, yes, Iran and the U.S. both have uh, an interest in defeating, in degrading, and destroying ISIS. And that is why I called for some sort of indirect and eventually direct tactical cooperation between Iran and the U.S. to defeat ISIS, because ISIS is not only a threat to the territorial integrity of Syria and to Iraq, it is also a threat to international peace, it is a threat to American national interests, and therefore I hope the two countries can coordinate their activities against this terrorist organization. And as you pointed out in your Foreign Affairs article, there was a historical precedent in, in the not too recent past for U.S.-Iranian coordination, military coordination, which was right after 9-11, there was coordination between the two countries against the Taliban. Absolutely. And for those in the West who thought, well, wait a minute, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Iran, they're all Islamic extremists and terrorists, this was very confusing. But the fact is that Iran was actually at odds with the Taliban well before the United States had a dog in that fight and it had almost had a shooting war. Absolutely. In fact, Iranian Revolutionary Guards uh, helped American special operations back in 2001 to dislodge the Taliban. Moreover, Iran played a, played a very important and critical role in the Bonn Conference mm. that determined the future of Afghanistan. Right. Had it not been for the intervention 
and insistence of Iran, Mr. Hamid Karzai, who was an American uh, choice to become president, would not have been president of Afghanistan. Iran had its own choice for the presidency of Afghanistan, but because Iran was collaborating with the Americans at that time, they decided to abandon their own candidate and instead support, uh, support Mr. Uh, Karzai. So there was cooperation on Afghanistan. Yes. Although it was immediately followed by the axis of evil speech. Unfortunately. Then you could say maybe not coordination, but common and overlapping interests between the U.S. and Iran in Iraq and the composition. Not the same exact views as you point out in your article. There are different approaches and in possibly some conflicts over the Kurdish issue and over the composition of the Iraqi government. Iran, uh, uh, Iran's policy toward Iraq during the occupation, of course, uh, is very controversial because on the one hand, Iran did provide support for some militias who killed American uh, soldiers in Iraq. There is no question about this. Uh, but at the same time, if you compare what Iran did in Iraq to what some other American allies did, you would see that Iran was much more in tune with American policy in Iraq overall than those allies were. Uh, because what happened after 2003, the balance of power in the Persian Gulf region, and I would say even beyond Persian Gulf, fundamentally changed in favor of Iran. In 2001, the Americans got rid, got rid of the Taliban. So that one was of Iran's one mortal enemies. mortal enemies, the nemesis of Iran. But more importantly, Saddam. they got rid of Saddam Hussein because Iraq historically was used by the Sunni Arabs to stop the expansion of Iran into the Levant and beyond. And for many years since the creation of Iraq back in 1921 by the British, the Sunnis who, are, who constitute Sunni Arabs, who constitute no more than 20% of the Iraqi population, were in control of Iraq, controlling about 60% of the Iraqi Shiites. The American invasion liberated Iraq and allowed the Shiites to dominate the Iraqi government. And when that, that happened, Iran was uh, found a much easier way to expand its influence, and that undermined Saudi Arabia's position in the Persian Gulf. Right, because in a now way, you have a, a Shia Arab state. That's right. So you have a Shiite Arab state that is no longer an enemy of Iran. Understand that Iraq under Saddam Hussein posed the greatest national security threat to Iran and inflicted more pain and, and destruction on Iran than anyone since the Safavid dynasty was established in 1501. That threat is now gone. At least at this time, it is gone, as we have a pro-Iranian, uh, Shiite-dominated uh, government in Baghdad. Yes, now about that, many people point to that and the way that Maliki governed Iraq since his election, his first election, as in many ways responsible for the rise of ISIS, the disenfranchisement and marginalization of the Sunni Arab population, not the Kurds, but the Sunni Arab population of Iraq. Because a lot of ISIS's supporters, a lot of commentators pointed out, ISIS by itself would not have been able to take over Mosul, this That's major right. city on its own. It needed the buy-in of right. local Sunni leaders, tribe, uh, former tribe, Baathists, former yes. Baathists. And so what do you make of this notion that it was really the Maliki government, supported by both Iran and the United States, the Maliki government's basically sectarian agenda, the argument goes. It's sectarian approach to governing the new Iraq that alienated these Sunnis, made them feel that they had no seat at the table in the new Iraq, and that's why they got so desperate that they supported ISIS. I think there is some element of truth to it, but I won't say that his policies were uh, entirely uh, to blame for the rise of ISIS. Uh, there are a lot of Sunnis in Iraq who have refused to accept the new reality of Iraq. They used to be the elites of Iraq, and right. they no longer are. And the fact that they were quiet for a long time, 
was due to the fact that the American surge and the American, the, this entire awakening movement, in fact, allowed Washington to purchase the loyalty of the Arab sheikhs. It wasn't that they had abandoned their opposition to any kind of Shiite government in Baghdad. They had simply received huge amounts of cash from Washington, for which they decided not to oppose American troops and not to uh, uh, kill Americans. Situationally. Situationally. Now, once the Americans left, uh, uh, the prime minister refused to pay them uh, the kind of money that the Americans were paying. And I think that contributed to the rise of ISIS. I think even if uh, uh, the prime minister would have pursued a more exclusive policy, uh, we would still have ISIS uh, becoming a major threat to uh, the government in Baghdad. And the reason why I say that is because you cannot understand the rise of ISIS by simply focusing on the prime minister, the former prime minister of Iraq. The regional players, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, all of those countries have their own agenda. And what uh, unite all of them together is that they simply do not like to see a Shiite dominated government in Baghdad. So they would use any kind of excuse to strengthen the Sunnis there. So uh, my short answer to yes. your excellent question is yes, uh, al-Maliki must be blamed for his sectarian agenda, but we should also remember there were other factors that allowed the ISIS to become such an important threat to the national security of Iraq and other regional players. Now, if we could bring this back to what I really wanted to get at in my original question, which is what might all of this mean for U.S.-Iran relations and specifically the nuclear deal? We are now, what is today? The 11th. So we are now 13 days, less than two weeks out from the November 24th deadline for this round of the nuclear negotiations between the U.S. and Iran. Mm. Where does this stand, these nuclear talks? What do you think is likely to happen and how might this ISIS picture affect it? I mean, one might have anticipated that with uh, the U.S.-Iranian alliance or at least uh, 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 overlapping of interests on mm. ISIS that this would bode well for the nuclear deal mm. and perhaps beyond from possibly even a deeper normalization of relations, restoration of diplomatic relations between the two countries. But the neocons and other members of the Republican Party seem to be pushing very hard against that yes. and going after Obama uh, to, to not cooperate with Iran, even on ISIS, yes. let alone on these other issues. So where do you see this going? There are three separate issues here. One is the nuclear negotiations. Two is what happens to the U.S.-Iran relations after uh, we have a nuclear agreement. And three is how to fight against ISIS. They are all interconnected, right. but at the same time, there are separate issues. Distinct but related. That's right. On the nuclear issues, I uh, have been on the record for saying that I am uh, cautiously optimistic. I would give 60% chance of having a final nuclear agreement between the group of five plus one, the five permanent members of the UN plus Germany and Iran. And uh, I still believe that this is uh, achievable. You think um, it'll happen in 13 days? Uh, I'm not very sure, but even if it doesn't happen in 13 days, I am pretty confident that the two sides would extend the deadline and they will eventually have a nuclear agreement. And the reason why I'm optimistic is because I believe the Ayatollah Khamenei and President Obama, uh, Mr. Rouhani, and I think a, a significant portion of American foreign policy establishment have concluded that it is in the national interest of both Iran and the U.S., as well as in the interest of the West, to uh, settle the nuclear dispute, to come out with a peaceful way of settling the dispute. Because if these negotiations fail, the alternatives do not look very good. Either we have to go to war with Iran, which would be catastrophic, or we have to impose more draconian sanctions in which case America would also pay for it. And I don't think it's going to be a good way uh, 
to, uh, to settle this nuclear dispute. So I am optimistic mm -hmm. that eventually we're going to have a nuclear deal. Now, the second issue is what happens after we have a agreement between Iran and the group right. of Right, is it a one-off? That's right. Does it stop there or does it open the door to a deeper that, reconciliation? That and this is where uh, there are some elements in Iran who share the, uh, the new Khan agenda of not trying to allow the nuclear deal to transform into or to evolve into better relationship between Iran and the U.S. So the hardliners uh, in Iran who are obstructionists in the way that the neocons are correct. obstructionists against Obama's agenda. Correct. Iran has its own version of this. Correct. But I think both of these forces are fighting against history because I think eventually Iran and the U.S. must find a way to manage their conflict. If they don't, it is very unlikely we are going to be able to defeat ISIS. It is very unlikely we're going to have enduring stability in the Persian Gulf region and in the Middle East. And then finally, the last issue is the issue of ISIS. Right. I think President Obama's strategy is a good start. It has some flaws. It has some internal contradictions in it. But I believe it is a good start. And people who usually criticize President Obama uh, for his strategy on Syria have yet to come out with a better strategy. It is very easy to trash a policy or to be critical of what someone is doing. But I always ask him, do you have a better alternative? Mm -hmm. So I think President Obama's strategy is pretty good. It has some problems, some weaknesses. And two of the major weaknesses is A, it is relying too much on some of the countries that have, in a way, contributed to the rise of ISIS. I think Washington needs to become a little bit more honest with its allies and to put pressure on them to stop supporting ISIS. So you're talking about Saudi Arabia particularly here, I take it? Well, I I'm just talking about countries in the Persian Gulf, and, and you and, and the listeners can decide which countries I'm talking about. But the Saudis would say we, as the Saudi government, mm -hmm. does not, we don't support ISIS. I, I think uh, right now, whether they supported ISIS or not before, I do not know. What we do know is that individual Saudis uh, had uh, contributed substantially to ISIS. Moreover, it's very important to, uh, to remind uh, the listeners that the ideology that ISIS has is essentially a Salafi Wahhabi ideology. And one big mistake a lot of people make is to equate that ideology with Sunnism. Salafi, Wahhabi constitute somewhere between, I've read different uh, stats, but somewhere between 8 to 15 percent of, of the Islamic world. It is, a, it is even smaller minority than the Shiites. And yet it's the official ideology of one of the most powerful countries in the Sunni That's world, right. and which they, is a major U.S. ally. Absolutely. And they, most of the Salafis are located in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in United Arab Emirates, a little bit in Bahrain, and that is it. So um, the problem is that President Obama is trying to rely on some countries that might oppose ISIS, but they do not oppose the fact that the Sunnis uh, have the right to sort of undermine the uh, Shiite government. Because remember, the, the, the struggle between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which is, I think, one of the major causes of the sectarian uh, conflict in the Middle East, is about who has the final say in the region. And we have seen this proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia manifest itself not only in Iraq, but also in Syria, in Lebanon, in Bahrain. It's or a region-wide phenomenon. region-wide. So going back to the strategy, the President Obama's strategy, he needs to be a little bit more forthcoming and straight with, uh, with American allies there. The second problem with this strategy is that if America does not want to have uh, boots on the ground in Iraq, then it must rely on local forces to defeat ISIS. Thus the Kurds. That's the Kurds and the Iraqi militias. I believe without some sort of agreement or consensus, uh, 
or collab, uh, cooperation with the Islamic Republic, America is going to have a tough time to defeat ISIS. Uh, Iran played a very important role in uh, helping Assad to undermine ISIS in Syria. Today, the only people who can fight against ISIS in Iraq are the Iraqi governments and the Iraqi militias. Both are very close allies of Iran. We know that the only major successes we have had in, inside Iraq against ISIS were done by the support of Iraqi militias against ISIS. Those and militias the and the Kurds, but those militias were and are being supported by Iran. How can you have a regional strategy with excluding Iran from that? So I think if these two issues are addressed, we will have a better chance of, of uh, succeeding in the policy of degrading and eventually destroying ISIS. Professor Milani, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. Great pleasure to talk with you.